call this meeting of the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee to order. Uh, we are meeting under House Rule 10.01, which allows us to hold these uh, hearings remotely. We will start with the roll. Anna, please go ahead. Chair Becker Finn. Present. Representative Moeller. Present. Representative Scott. Present. Representative Feist. Representative Frazier. Present. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Her. <laughs> Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Representative Long. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Navani. Navani, present. Just signing. Representative Farr. Present. Representative Robbins. Representative Fang. Present. Representative Shang. Present. All right, a quorum is present. Uh, first order of business is approving the minutes from March 11th. Uh, Representative Feist, would you move the minutes from March 11th? Yes, and I'm also present. <laughs> um, sorry, I logged in at the last minute and so moved, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Feist. Uh, any discussion to the minutes from March 11th, 2021? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the minutes are uh, adopted for March 11th, 2021. Um, as I'm sure nobody is surprised, we have another full agenda today. Uh, we're gonna squeeze in a couple uh, quick budget presentations to start getting us thinking about uh, our budget and some of the financial bills. So first up is uh, Civil Legal Services uh, to walk us through their budget request. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and then go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Chair Becker Finn, Vice Chair Moeller, and everyone on the committee for welcoming us this morning to present our budget. My name is Drew Schaefer. I am the Executive Director of Mid Minnesota Legal Aid, part of the Minnesota Legal Services Coalition. We really appreciate this time with you this morning to highlight our budget request. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Dori Streit, to introduce herself and to start our presentation. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Streit, please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead. Thank you, Chair Vicar Finn. My name is Dori Streit. I'm the Executive Director of Legal Aid Service of Northeastern Minnesota. And it looks like I'm having a little bit of screen sharing problems, so please give me just a moment. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can, Ms. Strait. Thank you so much. Yep, you can proceed. Okay, sorry, just trying to move to the next slide. Here we go. There you go. <laughs> so thank you so much for having us. Um, when Drew and I were here in January, we talked about the need for civil legal services, who we serve, how we deliver the services, and the impact of our work. Here again, you'll see a map of how we deliver these statewide services, and that's through six regional programs and 19 targeted programs. The budget request for civil legal services impacts the budget of all of these programs. So we are so grateful to have brought to you 15 letters of support for our budget request from statewide, local, and community partners. These letters represent the spectrum of our partners from local service providers to statewide legal system leaders. Our community partners submitted these letters of support to express their conviction in civil legal services full funding request to you so we can continue to meet the critical civil legal needs of the communities that rely on our assistance. So as you can see from our budget request, our focused basis for our requested increase of 5.6 million for this biennium is the salary crisis that's facing civil legal services. So if you take a look at this slide, you can see that the starting salaries for civil legal services attorneys are 
$335. And if you look at the starting salaries for comparable um, positions in the public sector, attorney positions in the public sector, you'll see. So when you look at our justice partners at the public defender's office, you'll see they're starting their attorneys at an amount 30.7% higher than what we start at. They're starting at 65,800, which is still a lower, when you look at the whole private sector, it's lower salaries for attorneys than they could get other places. But within the public sector, civil legal services starting attorneys are behind. They're not just behind these other public sector attorney positions, but they're also behind non-attorney positions. For example, county social workers and self-help assistants at the courthouses. It doesn't get better as you move along. So at 10 years of experience, as you can see here, our civil legal services staff are at about 60,428. And that's still below all those starting salaries. We simply can't compete at this level. The data we've collected over the last two years shows an 18% turnover rate for civil legal services. Legal aid attorneys want to serve the public, but they leave because we're not paying them the salaries that they deserve. The turnover impacts our numbers. It impacts the time it takes for us to rehire, especially in greater Minnesota, where there are legal deserts, meaning there aren't any there's just a very small number of private attorneys that want to work in those areas anyway. And that impacts our ability to hire. When we lose an attorney in those greater Minnesota offices, we are so nervous about how long it will take to actually find someone to join our team. So we brought this up to you before, and we've received increases from the state in the past, but not our full budget request. We've been left behind. And if we can't catch up to the other public entities now, civil legal services won't be able to continue serving the state in the capacity we have been, which will become its own crisis. Thanks, Dory. And there is a parallel crisis to the civil legal aid compensation deficit. And that is that for decades, civil legal services has been forced to turn away over half the people who come to us for help with their most basic human needs to protect their most basic civil and human rights. Over half of people were forced to turn away due to lack of resources. The current annual funding level for civil legal services coming from legislative appropriation is $14.72 million. That is part of an over, overall civil legal services budget of almost $46 million. So that is our total resource environment where we leverage the legislative appropriation with other resources we develop to serve as many people as we can in protecting their family safety, protecting their homes, protecting their human health, and again, protecting their most basic civil and human rights. We know that to meet all of the need that we are currently experiencing, all of the demand in our existing case priorities for eligible clients, it would take an additional investment over and above the current civil legal services legislative appropriation of an additional $75 million or a total of almost $90 million to meet all of the need in our existing case priorities with eligible clients coming to us right now for help. That is where we sit right now. And so our request, we are asking for a modest and measured increase to help to level the playing field for civil legal services in Minnesota and for people in the communities we serve statewide. For fiscal year 2022, we're asking for an increase of $2.208 million over and above our current funding level to help to start to make a dent in the civil legal aid compensation deficit and to sustain the services that we provide to people in Minnesota statewide. In fiscal year 2023, we're asking for an additional $1.27 million over and above the $2.208 million increase to continue 
to take steps to address the civil legal aid compensation deficit crisis. And again, this is far short of what it will take to serve Minnesotans in critical legal cases where they need our help, but it will allow us to begin to take the steps we need to improve our compensation and to sustain the critical representation services we provide statewide. And so with that, Dory and I uh, would love to entertain questions that the committee may have about our budget request and the critical services that we deliver to Minnesotans around the state. Thank you again for the opportunity to share this information this morning. Uh, thank you. And if you could, uh, thanks, uh, turn off the screen sharing, uh, that, that would be helpful. Um, I, I know that I have a question and I guess um, I'm wondering, I'm not sure which one of you can answer this, but uh, why aren't you asking for more? That is, Mr. Chair Beckerfin, thank you so Mr. much. Schaefer. For that question. Yeah. Thank you so much for that question. We do need more. We, in developing our requests, we're recognizing the budget realities that the state of Minnesota faced. And, you know, we're coming in with a bold request to begin to take steps, but to fully address the compensation deficit we face right now, and to continue to provide the current level of services that we provide, we would need an additional $10 million per year over what we're requesting. As we said, um, we are coming into this session recognizing the, the budget realities and with a plan over time to come back in the future to continue to try to address this problem with increased investment in civil legal services statewide. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I would <laughs> encourage you to, um, at this rate, we will not get to uh, the 90 million that it would actually require to serve the people of Minnesota um, until none of us are here um, in this space <laughs> anymore. So um, I just really want to emphasize what uh, those numbers, you know, that the current funding is only 14 million something, but to actually serve everybody who's eligible and especially when it's lower income folks and people in the rural parts of the state, um, you know, we are, we are really behind here. Uh, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question regarding family law. And um, I know in many cases, uh, both parents are low income. And so I'm wondering how you decide um, which parent you will represent. Is it kind of first come first serve? Or what is your decision-making process? And I know that's not a budget question, Madam Chair, but if you'd indulge me, that'd be great. Thank you. Yep, we got two minutes for you got to move to the next one, but uh, Ms. Streit or Mr. Schaefer? Chair Becker Finn. Thank you for the question, Representative Scott. So real quickly, um, we are bound by the rules of professional responsibility, obviously. So conflicts allow us to assist whoever uh, contacts us first. And so we have an intake process where we're getting confidential information from applicants. And then we have priorities within the legal aid organizations that inform how we decide who we're going to represent and what level of service we have the capacity to provide in family law cases. So really it could be either party. Um, and if the other party does contact us, we make a quality referral to another partner legal aid organization if one is available based on geographic area. Thank you for that response. Uh, Representative Scott, any follow-up? That's it, thank you. All right, um, well, thank you very much for coming in with that presentation today. Uh, members, I, as with everyone who comes in with presentations, I'm sure they would welcome uh, questions uh, later on if you wanna reach out to them. And I believe those slides were also emailed to everybody. So uh, thank you very much uh, for testifying in front of our committee today. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn, and thanks to all of you for welcoming us this morning. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, we will start the presentation for the Guardian Ad Litem Board. Uh, welcome to the committee. I believe we have uh, Tammy Baker Olson here again. Um, if you could introduce yourself and then go ahead with your presentation. Good morning, Chair Becker Finn and committee members. Uh, my name is Tammy Baker Olson, and I am the Guardian Light and Program Administrator. 
Thank you for having me back this morning to present on the Guardian of Light and Program budget request on behalf of the board. I want to begin my testimony by first thanking the legislature for its past support. The FY 2021 budget increase provided much needed financial relief that has helped to better ensure federal and state compliance and heightened program oversight. The additional funding further aided in the development of an independent family court division within the program, as well as help support the program's ICWA initiative. You have before you now the Guardian of Item Board's FY22-23 biennium budget request. As you can see in FY22, the Guardian of Item Board requests 206,000 in new funding to cover the employer's share of unavoidable health care cost increases. In FY23, the Guardian of Item Board requests 444,000 in new funding for a 3% compensation increase and 445,000 to offset employer health care cost increases. The current budget request is 2.49% over the starting base budget. I would like it to open it up at this time for any questions you may have. All right, uh, any questions for Ms. Baker Olson? And I, I note that you have uh, someone here from the state court administrator's office as well available for questions. That's correct. All right. Um, it looks like we don't have uh, any member questions. Uh, anything else, uh, Ms. Baker Olson? Just to thank you again for your time this morning. Okay. Thanks so much. Yep, thank you so much. And um, I believe you did have a presentation, but had some trouble getting it getting it up. So we'll make sure, um, I'm pretty sure that's already in members' virtual packets uh, for them to review as well. That it is, thank you, Chairperson. All right, thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so th those were, our, I think, the last of our budget presentations for the year. So we're going to move on to the bills on our agenda today. Uh, first up, we have uh, Representative Schultz. Uh, this is House File 2080. Uh, welcome to the committee, Chair Schultz. I move that House File 2080 be recommended to be re-referred to the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, Representative Schultz, your bill is now before us. Uh, please go ahead and tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for hearing House File 2080. This is a bill that will put Minnesota in federal compliance. Right now we're out of compliance and it requires individuals working for the state and it's across several of our agencies. Um, and our vendors that we contract with who use federal tax information require, require do we have a background study or national um, history report and a fingerprinting by the DCA. Um, we've been out of compliance for many years. This is a priority for the Department of Revenue and I believe they're here to explain more of the bill and to answer members questions. All right, sounds good. Uh, thank you, Representative Schultz. Uh, first on the list, I have Deputy Commissioner Ho. If you could introduce yourself and then go ahead with your testimony. Chair Becker Finn, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Lee Ho, Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. I'm here today on behalf of the Departments of Revenue, Human Services, Employment and Economic Development, and MNSURE, who rely on federal tax information to perform critical program functions. I would like to make a few brief remarks then take any questions the committee may have. First, I would like to thank Representative Schultz for carrying this bill on behalf of the Department of Revenue and other agencies who use federal tax information to perform their work. House File 2080 brings Minnesota into compliance with the Internal Revenue Service requirements for state and local governments to receive federal tax information. A change made to these requirements within the past few years now requires agencies using federal tax information to conduct fingerprint background investigations of individuals with access to this information. The legislation provides the affected agencies with authority to fingerprint individuals and conduct national criminal history record checks of individuals with access to federal tax information. These individuals include current or prospective employees of affected agencies, contractors of these agencies, employees or agents of a contractor with these agencies and any individual otherwise engaged by agencies who will have access to federal tax information, including local governments that support human services programs. Within the last 30 months, a majority of other states have enacted laws regarding fingerprinting of individuals with access to federal tax information. These states have completed or are in the process of implementing their fingerprint based 
criminal history checks. This legislation is needed for the Department of Revenue and other agencies that use federal tax information to administer their programs. For example, at Revenue, this information is used by tax research to develop revenue estimates and by our tax program areas to verify income and compliance with Minnesota's tax laws. At other agencies, this information is used to verify income to confirm program eligibility. Thank you, Chair Becker, Finn, and members of the committee. I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Great. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I, I note that we do have a couple other people here available to answer questions. Uh, members, discussion to the bill. Uh, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks um, for the presentation this morning. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if this has been a practice that the department is using now anyway, and if it's not, how many people are we going to have to fingerprint, and then um, how long will those fingerprints be kept? Will they be kept by the BCA? I know there's a lot of questions, <laughs> um, but I guess we'll start there. Thank you. All right. Uh, Deputy Commissioner. Chair Becker, Finn, members of the committee, our current check process uses federal and state databases to conduct criminal history checks upon hire or promotion. This background check includes a national criminal history check and fingerprinting and is conducted every five years, including for current employees. So this current change will include current employees and the routine will be practiced every five years. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thanks for that. And so approximately how many employees would that be statewide? And is there a cost per employee to do that? I don't know if there's a fiscal note to this um, bill and maybe that would be, I don't know if that would be a fiscal note to our committee or to HHS or taxes. I, yeah, thank you. Uh, let's start with Deputy Commissioner Ho. Chair Becker, Ben, Representative Scott. We estimate approximately 4,000 state employees and contractors will be involved in this process. And yes, there will be a minimal cost to each agency for the first biennium because it will take up to 12 months to receive approval to conduct the background checks from the IRS and the FBI before we can proceed. The second year will have some costs as we begin to implement the background checks and learn more about what is needed to sustain the program. We believe these costs can be absorbed in the first biennium and future costs after the first biennium would be included in agency operating budget adjustments if needed. Uh, thank you for that uh, explanation. Uh, any follow-up, Representative Scott? Nope, that's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, thank you. Uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker, Finn, members, I'm, I actually like this uh, bill because what is one thing that we have a lot of is it, is identity theft. And the best way to get that identity theft and the easiest way is being, being able to get some, at somebody's tax records. It's got all the information they need. Uh, with these background checks, they should be done already. Um, and it's, it's a way to protect the citizens of Minnesota's uh, identity and their tax records to make sure that they're not being misused by somebody that uh, unfortunately get in, able to get into the system without doing these checks now. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Uh, not seeing any other hands. Uh, Representative Schultz, uh, any closing words? No, just thank, I'd like to thank the committee for hearing this bill. I know it got a late start, so I really appreciate you squeezing it in. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, uh, thank you, Representative Schultz. And with that, I will renew my motion that House File 2080 be recommended to be re-referred to the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Representative Frazier. Representative Grassel, excused. Representative Her. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Representative Long. Representative Liebling. Oh, sorry. Representative Mortensen. Aye. Representative Novotny. Aye. Representative Barth. Aye. 
Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Bang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. There's 14 ayes and no nays. Uh, with that, the motion prevails and House File 2080 is on its way to the Public Safety Committee. I will note uh, for the record, we had uh, many members with bills up uh, that they're presenting in other committees. And uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's where both uh, Representative Long and Representative Frazier are. Uh, thank you, members. We will move on to the next bill uh, on the agenda, which is House File 1080. It is a Representative Richardson bill. Uh, I will move that House File 1080 be recommended to be referred to the Commerce Committee. Uh, Chair Richardson, welcome to the committee and please tell us about your bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I do have an amendment to get the bill in the shape that I would like. Uh, would you like me to speak to the amendment first? Uh, yes, I will move the A1 amendment and please tell us about the A1 amendment. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The A1 amendment makes a number of technical changes to better align with the Minnesota Human Rights Act. It incorporates the Minnesota Human Rights Act definition of dis uh, disability so that Minnesota case law applies, uh, defines enrollee, adds the Minnesota Human Rights Act to the list of existing laws that would not be limited or replaced if someone sought relief through the court for an allegation of uh, organ transplant discrimination. Um, it deletes the public policy subdivision and it also clarifies the remedies under the bill, including the ability to initiate a uh, civil action. All right, thank you for that explanation of the A1 amendment. Uh, any questions, members? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Chair Richardson, your bill as amended is now before us. Please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File 1080 seeks to address discrimination in the organ transplant process. Since organ transplantation became available as a treatment option, people with disabilities have faced significant barriers to accessing the life-saving procedure. 16 states have passed similar legislation and seven other states have legislation pending. Denying organ transplants to people with intellectual and neurodevelopmental disabilities like autism and Down syndrome solely on the basis of their disability is an issue that we have to address. A widely cited research study found an estimated 44% of organ transplant centers said they would not add a child with some level of neurodevelopmental disability to the organ transplant list. 85% of transplant centers might consider the disability as a factor in deciding whether to add a person to the list. Each organ transplant center has its own policies and practices governing how it decides which patients to accept and submit to the national waiting list. Some doctors and organ transplant centers have current and past practices that treat psychiatric disabilities or intellectual and de developmental disabilities as an absolute contraindication to transplant, meaning that a particular candidate for an organ transplant is unsuitable solely due to their disability. According to a 2019 report from the National Council on Disability, many doctors and transplant centers worry that patients with intellectual or neurodevelopmental disabilities will have co-occurring uh, conditions that will um, not improve their quality of life, or they believe that patients will not comply with post-surgical instructions and use that as a rationale to deny access. But the research proves that none of those concerns are universally true. When looking at the three-year survival rate for people with intellectual uh, disabilities with kidney transplants, the survival rate was 90%, the same as the national overall rate for those without disabilities. Another study showed the five-year graph survival rate for patients with intellectual disability was identical to the rate for um, matched patients without an intellectual uh, disability. And looking at heart transplants, um, four out of five uh, patients with a disability were still uh, alive after transplant, which was uh, similar to uh, what we would see among non-disabled people as well. People with disabilities can successfully receive transplants with adequate support. It's also important to remember that many people without disabilities need adequate support as well following uh, a transplant. The 2019 report from the National Council on Disability urged state legislatures to adopt clear and detailed laws 
prohibiting disability-based discrimination in the transplant process. The lives of people with disabilities are equally valuable to those without, and healthcare decisions that devalue the lives of people with disabilities is discriminatory. Today, I have with me Noah McCourt and a few other testifiers to testify on behalf of the bill. Uh, thank you, Chair Richardson. I don't see uh, that Noah is signed in yet, so we will go to the second testifier on the list, which is Erica Hillier. Uh, Erica, please introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for taking the time to hear from me today. My name is Erica Hillier, and on September 10th, 2018, I gave birth to seven pounds and eight ounces of absolute perfection, my first child, Jonathan Milo. That day changed my life in obvious ways, but it was also the day that I could no longer ignore, even unintentionally, the largest minority group in the country, the disabled. You see, Johnny had surprised us with an extra chromosome. And there are a lot of assumptions that come with a diagnosis of Down syndrome. Without knowing him, people make assumptions about my son's abilities solely based on his diagnosis. Worse, people will also make assumptions about his worth and his quality of life. People wonder if we wish he had been born neurotypical or if we were worried our next child might also have Down syndrome. The answer is an emphatic no, by the way, we would be lucky to have another child just like Johnny, truly. Today, Johnny's a two and a half year old ball of fire. He learns sign language faster than his dad and I can keep up with. He models for Target and I've never been teased so relentlessly by a toddler in my life. The idea that he might be denied an organ transplant if he ever needed one simply because of an extra chromosome and somebody else's preconceived idea of what that means for his life is a tragedy. Anyone who meets Johnny would tell you he's absolutely worthy of life, and yet it happens around the country. And here in Minnesota, people with disabilities are still being denied life-saving organ transplants, are being placed lower on the wait list, or aren't even being referred in the first place simply because of their disability, not because they aren't medically qualified. In the process of pursuing this legislation, I was contacted by a Minnesota mother, Nikki Golden, her teenage son Bryce has autism and was denied being placed on the transplant list by two separate Minnesota hospitals. The family was told the reason for refusal was due to his autism diagnosis and their belief that he wouldn't be able to comply with the medical requirements, even though he'd repeatedly proven that he would. Eventually, one of Bryce's doctors told the family they needed to go elsewhere for a transplant because Bryce was out of time and Minnesota was getting in the way. Thankfully, Nikki and Bryce were able to relocate to a state where this legislation had already been passed and Bryce received his liver transplant last year. Still, no Minnesotan should have to leave our state and be separated from their family to access necessary life-saving health care. Three weeks ago, I gave birth to another son, just as perfect, loved, and valuable as my first. But one less chromosome means I will never have to worry a medical professional might decide his life is not worth saving. The worth of my firstborn is not, nor should it ever be in question. Johnny is fully human and as such, he should have the same access to organ transplants and anatomical gifts that you or I would. House File 1080 will ensure that medically eligible patients in Minnesota who have cognitive, developmental, intellectual, neurological, or physical disabilities are never discriminated against when seeking an organ transplant. This bill will also prohibit health plans from denying insurance coverage for transplant related care based on disability. And if an eligible patient is discriminated against in the organ transplant process, they can file a civil action and have that claim heard quickly and efficiently to reach resolution. Our team has worked diligently to address feedback we received during last year's leg legislative session in order to present you with the bill before you today. I hope that everyone on this committee votes to move forward House File 1080 without hesitation, not just for me and my family, but for all Minnesotans. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Hillier, and uh, congratulations on your new baby as, as well. Um, thank, you. And thank you for sharing the stories of others as well. Uh, next on the list, I have Amanda Collins. Uh, Ms. Collins, please introduce yourself and then go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chairperson Becker and committee members. My name is Amanda Collins. My youngest son has Down syndrome and a congenital heart defect. My oldest son actually selected organ transplant discrimination as his high school senior government project, which included reaching out to his representative and is the reason why I'm here speaking to you today. My youngest is a happy, energetic six-year-old kindergartner who loves Mickey Mouse and Paw Patrol and playing with his siblings, cousins, and friends. He has a congenital heart defect and during our prenatal ultrasounds, it appeared that his heart was unbalanced, which comes with many surgeries and many times requires a heart transplant for long-term survival. 
His vinyl diagnosis is still a very complex heart defect. And after two open heart surgeries, his heart is mended, but not fixed. We won't know the need. We know he needs additional heart surgeries, but we don't know the future, what will come with his complex heart. This bill is necessary because even though we have amazing doctors and hospitals in Minnesota, there's provider bias that starts as early as the referring physician. This bias of doctors around treatment options for those with, dis with disabilities is something we have dealt with before, since before my son was born. We've had to seek out second opinions to get the care my son deserves. Not organ transplant related, but our most notable experience has been with my son's tethered spinal cord diagnosis. This is a diagnosis that is typically made around six months of age. Um, my son was seen by multiple specialists, physical therapists, doctors, where we raised concerns of his gross motor delays. He wasn't standing, walking, um, and very delayed be behind his peers with Down syndrome. Our concerns were never taken seriously, and we continued to hear, give him more time, he has Down syndrome. It took us going to the Down syndrome clinic where the physician finally listened to our concerns and pushed for testing, which led to the diagnosis and allowed surgery to release the tether at four and a half. This delay from six months to four and a half may result in my son suffering from permanent complications. If provider bias with a tethered spinal cord diagnosis resulted in a four-year delay in treatment, what type of provider bias is impacting individuals with a disability that need a time-sensitive, life-saving transplant? Our story has many parallels to one of the other written testimonies you received from another Minnesota mom. The difference is that her prenatal ultrasound showed her son's multiple heart defects could lead to a transplant. She asked her cardiologist what, how, much, her, how many surgeries her son's heart could handle before needed a transplant. And with a matter of fact tone of voice, the cardiologist informed her that he may be able to get through five surgeries, but ultimately would not qualify for a transplant because he has Down syndrome. This bill not only impacts my family and my community of friends, but also what drives me at my job at Be The Match National Merit Donor Program. Daily, I get to see how we are successfully serving patients in need of cellular therapy, most notably bone marrow transplants. This bill will help ensure that all people, irrespective of disability, are able to access the cellular, ther cellular therapy that they need. On behalf of my family, my son with Down syndrome and his sibling advocate, I'm requesting your support of House File 1080. We wanna make sure that if he or anyone else with a disability needs a transplant, that their disability diagnosis is not utilized as the reason to delay or deny a transplant. It should not be up to a doctor or insurance company to determine if their life is worth saving. The same assessment process should be followed for any individual who needs a life-saving transplant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I don't have anyone else uh, on the list uh, who is here today. Uh, members, any discussion to the bill? Uh, Representative Moeller. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, thanks to Chair, uh, Chair Richardson for bringing this bill and also our testifiers. and. Uh, and Ms. Collins, thank you for, for your advocacy and for your son writing that letter to me as a high school student. Um, it's just so important that um, people know about this issue and that we can get this fixed. So I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody for being here today. Thank you, Vice Chair Moeller. Um, good, uh, good reminders for all of us to opt into being an organ donor uh, as well if, if people have not done that. Um, members, any further discussion to the bill? All right, with that, uh, Chair Richardson, any closing comments for us? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just um, uh, thank the testifiers and ask for support. Thank you, Chair Richardson, and thank you to the testifiers as well. Um, I renew my motion that House File 1080, as amended, be recommended to be re-referred to the Commerce, Finance, and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker-Finn. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Austin, excused. Representative Hurt. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Hollins, aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Representative Mortensen. Aye. Representative Navani. Aye. Representative Farr. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Fang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Represent aye. Perfect. Representative Zhang, aye. There's 15 ayes and no nays. 
Um, if you could see if uh, Representative Long is in the room uh, again, I think he may have just gotten back in here. Representative Long? Hi. Perfect. There is 16 ayes and no nays. Great. Thank you, Anna. Uh, with that, the motion prevails and House File 1080 as amended is on its way to the Commerce, Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, Chair Richardson and testifiers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with that, yeah, thank you. Uh, with that, we will we'll keep it moving. Uh, next on the agenda is House File 592, a Representative Christensen bill. I will move that House File 592 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Uh, Representative Christensen, your bill is now before us. Please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Um, state agencies, councils, and groups across Minnesota work to identify and provide services for individuals and families experiencing homelessness. In partnership with the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness, and in accordance with Heading Home, Minnesota's plan to prevent and end homelessness, the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs has developed the Homeless Veterans Registry. The registry assembles a team of housing and service professionals who work together to help veterans on a case-by-case -case basis to access housing and services that meet their needs. Data for individuals experiencing homelessness is classified as private data under Minnesota Statute 13.587. The result is an, a limitation which has led to a fragmented and inefficient response to time-sensitive crisis situations for individuals and families experiencing homelessness. This proposal classifies data on individuals on the Homeless Veterans Registry as private and authorizes the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs to share or disclose an individual's data to coordinate homelessness prevention efforts um, with members and homeless veterans registry partners to respond quickly to an individual experiencing homelessness or at the risk of homelessness. The intent of the bill is to drastically increase the timeliness and efficiency of addressing the needs of individual veterans experiencing homelessness in Minnesota, streamlining processes and procedures allowing for quick, quicker response times to veterans in crisis. And with that, I'll turn it over to my testifier, Ben Johnson from the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. All right, welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Johnson, please introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn, uh, Representative Christensen for carrying this and members of the committee. Um, Representative Christensen did a nice job explaining what we're attempting to accomplish here. Uh, MDVA currently uh, offers homeless veterans registry programming. Uh, this is uh, not standing up a, a program that doesn't already exist. Uh, and, and in fact, this makes it easier for us to accomplish our goals. Um, thus far, we have, uh, we have secured housing uh, outcomes for more than 2,000 veterans. And that's going back about seven years. And currently on our homeless veterans registry, we have 277 veterans identified. Um, data is key to how we accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. And what this would permit us to do is more easily adjust uh, and find uh, housing outcomes more quickly. Um, at this time, we uh, have a Tennyson warning that is provided to every veteran who joins the registry. It is 100% opt-in. It, uh, it is something that a veteran has to agree to participate on. Um, the challenge that we have is when we identify new partners to work with either in uh, private sector or public sector, uh, we have to go back and redraft the tennis and warning to add this group, a, a new group to the a list of it, potential um, supporters, uh, and then go back and try and secure new signatures from any person who's on our homeless veterans registry. So uh, the way that we've been accomplishing it where we, when, when we're unable to uh, uh, find a veteran quickly is work with, uh, with partners in active cooperation agreements. Um, but at, at this time, um, we think that the best way to go forward is to stand this uh, stand this program up in statute under the uh, governor's excuse me under the commissioner's uh, authorities, and then identify uh, the veterans' data that we have as private and continue to protect it as such. Um, we also have Sloan Kessler available to answer more specific questions. He's a homeless program coordinator with MDVA. Thank you, Mr. Johnson and Chair Becker Finn had to step aside for a minute. So I've got the, the gavel for just so people know why I'm stepping in here. 
Um, let's see. So Sloan Kessler, if you can go ahead and introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Hi, good morning, Chair. City members. Oh, okay. Go, go ahead, Ms. Kessler. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if you planned on testifying. I don't um, plan Chair, on testifying. So I'm okay. available for questions. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. Sorry. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, so it looks like we have a question from Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the testifiers. Representative Christensen, thanks for bringing this bill. It's an important bill. Um, and um, I appreciate the dialogue that we had via email over the weekend, um, answering some of my questions. And um, Mr. Johnson, I appreciate you elaborating on um, how this works. Um, and I thank you that you have the Tennyson warning in place. Um, there are other agencies that kind of, could kind of learn from all of this. Um, I do have just still one concern, and that is, since you're, my understanding is that you're going to be kind of doing away with these um, cooperative agreements, um, um, so that you can share this data more more freely. And so when you onboard new um, new partners, so to speak, that you don't have to go back to the veteran and get their um, their um, consent. But I'm wondering how you will keep track of who that data has been shared with. And do you have anything in place that would tell those entities that they cannot share the data further? Or what does that look like? I know you also said over the weekend that you do um, some periodic audits. And so could, if you could elaborate on those issues um, and get those on the record, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Scott. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair Moeller, Representative Scott, I actually will lean on Sloan Kessler for this answer. She's the sort of subject matter expert on the technical side. So, um, Sloan, please. All right, go, All right, ahead, go ahead, Kessler. Ahead. Absolutely. Chair Moeller and Representative Scott, that's a really great question and a really good point for clarification. Um, we do not plan on doing away with any of the cooperation agreements. I think that should be something that should be, be noted here. We still plan on doing everything we can with the cooperation agreements, uh, keeping track of who, which partners uh, we're working with. We also renew those cooperation agreements every two years so that we're always keeping track of who does have access to the registry. And then also just want to point out a few different things within the cooperation agreement is that there's a consistent agreement with our partner agencies to let us know uh, who is uh, has left an agency as quickly as possible so that we can maintain uh, the, the data sharing uh, and also um, they are required to not keep private data um, in their hands after they have uh, submitted their information for a veteran that's being added to the registry. Representative Scott. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that answer. Um, um, members, uh, they're doing it right. They have all the right policies, and um, you know, I'm going to be introducing a bill here coming up that kind of puts this in statute that every agency should be doing these sorts of things so that we don't have to keep coming back and, and having the same conversation in uh, whenever they want to share data. Uh, um, otherwise, our statute books are going to be really, really thick um, if we put this kind of language in. Um, again, right now, it's just in the, um, the, the Veterans Administration's policy. And I would like to see something in statute that applies to all agencies so that it's crystal clear to all these agencies that want to share data that this is best practices. This is what you need to do in order to share data uh, for private data. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative Scott. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mueller, members, I'm not sure who can an answer this question, uh, whether it's the uh, the testifiers or not. My concern is we're going to be sharing this data and I know you have the audit trails and stuff, but, but I'm wondering how often that it, is it updated? You could have somebody that's been on the list as homeless for two, three weeks and they they end up finding housing. Um, but there's, they're going to be sharing data with that person that uh, with these other organizations that he is not, he's a homeless person. And my concern is that gets out, even though it's, it's private data, it could affect that person down the road. Um, and or somebody else that 
actually needs that housing by the time they find that individual, uh, that spot might be gone. So I'm just wondering how long do they up that, how well they update the data and keep it correct uh, for those that are homeless. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Who, uh, let's see, Ms. Kessler, go ahead. Thank you so much, Chair, Representative Johnson. Um, the answer to that question is that we do a bi-weekly meeting. So we're looking at the list and we're updating the data bi-weekly for the statewide list. So we have two, uh, well, three different meetings. So we've got a Hennepin County specific uh, meeting. We have a Ramsey County specific meeting. Then we have a greater Minnesota uh, specific meeting. So so the list of homeless veterans is, is being worked. That data is being updated bi-weekly. Uh, and so we are very confident in that if someone is going into housing to permanent housing, uh, they're, they're marked as such. Uh, and then that housing option is kind of connected for that veteran. And then we move on. And, and although that data is, is there, we're moving on to the next homeless individual so that we can make those, those uh, further connections. Thank you, Ms. Kessler. Follow up, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Mueller, this just proves my, my theory that the veterans know how to do things and do things right. They're well ahead of us. They're doing things. I wish the rest of the departments across the state would do things and prepare and plan and do what's right all the time like the veteran services do. Thank you. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, Representative Christensen for bringing this bill. Um, regarding uh, Chair Johnson's question, how long is the data actually kept? Because um, my understanding is that, you know, a lot of these veterans do find homes within 90 days. And so is it stored forever? Is there some system that says they were at one point homeless? Or is the data, you know, purged at a certain point? Could you speak to that, please? Go ahead, Ms. Kessler. Chair Representative Robbins, uh, we do keep the data in our Homeless Veteran Registry data system. Uh, that itself is a platform that was built with Minute, so it's passed all of our Minute security uh, systems, and so that da that data um, on individuals is collected. Uh, we do see that it is very useful to to keep data in our internal system, so that we are able to um, assist when if and when a veteran might experience homelessness again. Uh, and as to not re-traumatize individuals, uh, having them continue to tell their stories uh, as they work with service providers, that is uh, uh, helpful for us to keep that data uh, and then work with the um, social service agencies that are working with those individuals. So we do keep the data, uh, whether or not, you know, it, it's an internal system and it's definitely uh, past all of the minute security uh, requirements that are needed there. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one more question, maybe to the bill's author, or I'm not sure who. So I, I found it interesting in the language of the bill that it says the commissioner may establish a veteran stable, ho stable housing initiative. And if the commissioner establishes this, you know, then they provide resources, et cetera. So, you know, normally, at least in my short experience, we talk about creating a program. So is there a difference between creating, what, what does it mean that we're creating this initiative and what resources and staff would be necessary or are you anticipating if this is created? I'm not sure who wants to answer that. Um, okay, Mr. Johnson, go ahead. Uh, Chair Moeller, uh, Representative Robbins, thank you for the question. Um, the, the reason that we crafted it that way is pretty straightforward. Uh, our goal is to become the fourth state to bring an end to veteran homelessness. And so our goal is to make this program um, in essence, run its course and and achieve achieve functional zero for veterans homelessness. And so, if there's an opportunity for us to um, to sort of hang up the hat um, because we've accomplished it, and there are systems in place that that uh, I think the phrase is uh, uh, when homelessness occurs that it is brief and non reoccurring. Um, that we've got systems in place statewide to address that. So the may versus shall um, gives us the opportunity to to uh, close the file, so to speak, on this program. Um, and in addition, working with the revisor's office, uh, the question of may versus shall um, has come up numerous times. And they said the permissive is better than the, um, than the requirement. Any follow-up, Representative Robbins? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and I appreciate that answer and I appreciate that intent. Um, just if you could address why, um, you know, you did reference it as a program, why are we calling it an initiative in statute? Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair Moeller, Representative Robbins, um, I, I guess that would just be semantics. That's the initiative versus program. We have we have it stood up within our programs and services division as a as a uh, homelessness um, uh, a homelessness program. Um, I, I I would def <laughs> I guess I would say that initiative versus program is is uh, uh, not a significant distinction. Though if you have a, a recommendation, I'm happy to hear. Okay, one last comment, Representative Robin. Thank you. I just appreciate right. the, the understanding. Thank you. Yep. All right. And uh, one final note, Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't want to belabor this, but um, in my back and forth over the weekend, I did ask about the data retention. And my understanding is that the department uses, um, there's a statewide data retention schedule. And so my understanding is, is that, um, that's what they're using and they could elaborate on that um, and that data retention schedule by the way I think needs to be updated too so anyway another area of statute to tackle at some point but thank you Madam Chair. Okay great. Um, Representative Christensen any final comments to your bill? Yes uh, thank you Madam Chair and thank you members um, for the great questions too so that we could clarify. Um, and thank you to my testifiers and thank you to the veterans and all they do. So hopefully we can tackle this problem. Uh, thanks much. Please support House File 592. All right, uh, Chair Becker Finn renews her motion that House File 592 be recommended to be placed on the general register and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Representative Frazier. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Hurt. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. Aye. Representative Novotny. Aye. Representative Fong. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Vang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. And Representative Frazier. Aye. If there are 16 ayes and no nays. There being 16 ayes and no nays, the motion prevails. House file 592 is recommended to be placed on the general register. Thank you so much, Representative Christensen. And I'm handing the gavel back to Chair Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Moeller, uh, for giving me the virtual gavel back. Uh, and, and as always, doing a good job keeping us moving in committee. Uh, the next bill on our agenda is House File 1865. It is the Representative Hewitt bill. Uh, Representative Hewitt, uh, welcome back to the committee. Uh, I will move that House File 1865 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Your bill is now before us. Please uh, tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. It's nice to be back in front of your committee again today. Uh, this is a pretty basic bill. Um, it was brought to me by the counties. Uh, what the counties are asking us to do is make two temporary uh, provisions that we uh, started during COVID uh, permanent, one being the one of um, uh, marriage license applications to apply virtually, and the other one is uh, to hold harmless the rule of uh, probate uh, and wills in Minnesota. Fortunately, I have two testifiers here with me from uh, one from Sherburne County and one from Brown County. I would like them to kind of get into the weeds with you on this a little bit, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Hewitt. Um, hopefully we won't have to go too far in the weeds since neither of these issues is, is new to this committee. Uh, first up on the list, I have Michelle Ash. If you could uh, introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Michelle Ash, and I currently serve as the elected recorder of Sherburne County. Uh, I am with you today to testify in favor of House File 1865, 
relating to the removing of the in-person appearance requirement for applications for a marriage license. The global COVID-19 pandemic has opened the door to expanding on the way that we provide local government services. One of our first hurdles was the request for a marriage license. It was a struggle and until we had uh, the in-person waiver in place. In the meantime, counties have established safe and efficient processes to handle remote applications both now and going forward. When we uh, are fully open again, situations will continue to arise where it would be extremely helpful if couples could apply remotely. Remote processing allows those applicants who are unable to travel for whatever reason to securely make applications for a marriage license remotely and still be safe. We in turn are providing excellent customer service that is appreciated by our residents. Our constituents have also mentioned how grateful they are for government working to be more convenient for their needs and busy schedules. Frankly speaking, it's a win-win for all involved. I would also note that this law would be permissive and would represent another tool in the toolbox for local governments. Counties who do not wanna offer this are not obliged to. And finally, this bill has the support of the Association of Minnesota Counties, the Minnesota Intercounty Association and the Minnesota County Recorders Association. It has also been coordinated with the Minnesota Association of County Officers and the Minnesota Association of County Administrators. Uh, with that, I would entertain any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you for your testimony. We do have uh, one other testifier on the list, uh, Betty Camels from Brown County. If you could introduce yourself and then go ahead with your testimony. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Betty Camels, the elected county recorder in Brown County, Minnesota, South Central Minnesota. And uh, Michelle does an excellent job of introducing this. And I just wanna reiterate that yes, the in-person marriage was our first hurdle too when the pandemic shut us down. Um, we had processes in place to record documents, to issue birth certificates, issue death certificates, but we did not have any way to handle the in-person requirement for the marriage application. So it just, shed light on an inherent flaw in the system. And so if we can eliminate that in-person requirement, um, we can greatly um, improve our services. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, looks like we do have a couple member questions. Uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Beck Becker, in uh, Representative Hoyt, I do have some concerns with this. I look back to when I got my marriage license. Uh, my wife was divorced and we actually, I actually, we actually had to bring in her um, uh, divorce decree with the seal to prove that uh, it was divorced to make sure. Um, how, I'm just wondering how this is gonna work if they do it uh, online, how are you gonna get that official seal to them and what's gonna happen? Um, or is somebody gonna be able to forge that uh, document by doing it online because they can do that real easy right now um, with uh, misrepresentation of documents. Uh, not sure who wants to take that one. Uh, Representative Hewitt. Oh, you're muted. Yep, sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I would refer to one of the testifiers because they've been dealing with this right now and one has their hand up, so that's great. All right, uh, Ms. Cummels, please uh, go ahead. Yes, um, as of right now, Minnesota does not require the um, applicants to bring in a certified copy with a seal of their divorce decree. They do have to indicate on the application if there was a previous divorce, but they do not have to provide documentation for it. All right, thank you. Uh, follow up, Representative Johnson. Uh, uh, Chair Becker, Finn, uh, to the testifier. Is that because we went online that they don't have to bring it in? Or I, I just, just wondering how that, when that changed. Uh, Ms. Cummels. Uh, no, that did not change at this point. Um, that has not been required 
for as long as we've been handling marriage certificate or marriage applications and I've been in the office 40 years. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Kummels. Uh, moving on to uh, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a personal experience to share. Um, so I got divorced in New Orleans and then Hurricane Katrina like destroyed a lot of documents. And so I couldn't access a certified copy of my divorce decree. And so when I got remarried in Hennepin County in 2007, we had this situation where we very much did not have certified copies as proof of my divorce and it all went just fine. So that was my experience with them not requiring those certified documents. Thanks. All right, thank you. And I, again, I, I don't think, and none of that changed due to the pandemic and that's not really, um, <laughs> wouldn't change anything uh, under this bill. So um, not sure uh, what, which county and when uh, Representative Johnson got married, but um, I'm sorry that he had to jump through that extra hoop. Uh, uh, any further discussion members to the bill? Uh, closing words, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members, and to the testifiers, thanks for taking time to come before the committee today. Um, real quickly, we're going to find things like this during that worked really well during the pandemic that we can carry over to making our counties and our government op, uh, operate more efficiently. So I, I appreciate the uh, committee support. All right, uh, with that, I will renew my motion that House File 1865 be recommended to be placed on the general register. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Representative Scott. No. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Frazier, aye. Representative Grossel, excuse. Representative Hurt. Aye. Representative Hollins? Aye. Representative Johnson? No. Representative Liebling? Aye. Representative Long? Aye. Representative Mortensen? Aye. Representative Novotny? No. Representative Farr? No. Representative Robbins? No. Representative Vang? Aye. And Representative Sean? Aye. We have a 11 eyes and five days. All right, with that, the motion prevails and House File 1865 is uh, recommended to be placed on the general register. Uh, we will move on to House File 1374. This is a Representative Frazier bill. Um, Representative Frazier, would you like to move your bill to be recommended to be re-referred to Ways and Means? I would, Madam Chair, thank you. All right, thank you, Representative Frazier. Your bill is now before us. Uh, please tell us about your bill. Madam Chair, as many of you are aware, during the July 2020 special session, the legislator passed the Minnesota Police Accountability Act. This act includes the creation of a centralized database of officer misconduct data. The data included in the database is currently all public data, meaning you could go down to your local law enforcement agency and make a data request for the data, and the agency should be able to provide it to you. The purpose for collecting this data is to require the post board, one, to evaluate the effectiveness of officer training, two, to assist the Citizens Council in accomplishing its duties, and three, to allow for the Council and the Complaint Investigation Committee to identify patterns of behavior that may suggest an officer is likely to violate a model policy. Lastly, the post board is required to submit an annual report to the legislator to, that includes summary data related to officer misconduct. A copy of this report must be available for the public on the post board's website. This bill expands the current database to include certain private police officer data. As with the public data currently being reported, the chief law enforcement officer, also known as a CLIO, will also be required to submit in real time private data. The data classification will not change. The classification will remain private as defined in chapter 13. The intent in making this change is to capture data that would assist the post board in developing an effective early warning system to identify problem officers. Currently, the public data shared to the post board does not encompass complaints that did not result in formal discipline because that data isn't defined as public under Chapter 13. Passing House File 1374 into law will provide the post board with the data it needs to effectively develop and ultimately implement the early warning system 
as was intended when the Police Accountability Act was voted into law in the summer of 2020. With that, Madam Chair, I would like to open it up to my testifier. Thank you, Representative Frazier. I have Dr. Gina Erickson. Please introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Hi, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Dr. Gina Erickson, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Criminal Justice and Forensic Science at Hamlin University. I'm here today to speak about the primary need for data on officers in Minnesota. Last summer, my colleagues and I made several recommendations for necessary and doable police reforms. We spoke formally with the Post Board, with several legislators, and wrote multiple op-eds noting the need for exactly this kind of basic data collection. As Representative Frazier noted, Minnesota was once a pioneer in thinking about law enforcement oversight. However, the last few years have brought several unfortunate and high-profile civilian deaths at the hands of police officers. Collecting data earlier and more often is one way we can work proactively to prevent these kind of tragedies in the future. Currently, the data collected by the Post Board shows only a fraction of complaints against officers, only those that are already publicly available. These instances have already risen to a worrisome level. This bill expands the current database of the Post Board. It does not collect any new information, but rather compiles at a state level the data already, that already lives within an agency. The classification of the data would not change, it will remain private. And so far, 31 states have introduced bills promoting similar kinds of reform. And some states have already enacted similar legislation. Minnesota, once a national leader in police oversight and regulation, is now falling significantly behind other states. And the civilian de deaths at the hands of officers by use of force, from Jamar Clark to Philando Castile to George Floyd, are putting us more and more under the national microscope. This bill would be a major step in working toward the goal of preventing critical and tragic incidents of use of force. We need data collection of this nature to centrally capture the kind of data necessary for early intervention and to prevent civilian lives. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, with that members, we will open it up to a uh, discussion uh, or any questions uh, to the bill. All right, uh, seeing none, uh, Representative Frazier, uh, Representative, oh, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn. Uh, questioned the author and had testimony about this extensively uh, previously, so I do not feel it would do any good to revisit uh, those issues, but I find it ironic at a time when clearing records and making data unavailable without a conviction. Now, just the mere appearance of a complaint on someone's record, um, just the complaint, not substantiated, just a number is a, is a, a way of condemning uh, a person. Um, just uh, two standards different ends. I don't know what the end goal is. Um, question the, the motivation of the last testifier. Um, I'll be voting no. I'm gonna... A little emotional. I uh, found out yesterday that uh, a true servant of a, of a deputy that I served with, uh, with four and a half years on has decided that um, the, the onslaught is too much, and it's best to get off the boat now. Uh, he has a, the ship has sailed, but he feels he can still make it back to shore, so he's getting off. Um, just hope someday we can turn the ship around. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and. Um... Is, is there anyone here from the post board on this call? I had kind of a technical question for them. Um, I'm not sure if there is somebody, uh, please, un, uh, Representative Frazier. No, there, 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 was, there was no one to, that could be available um, on, on, in the notice that we provided to them for this hearing. So unfortunately, they are not, they are not here. But uh, Representative Scott, if you want to ask a question, I mean, there were some technical questions at the prior one. If, if, if it was addressed, I, I will respond. If not, we'll get you the answer. Okay. And, and Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question was just that in looking over these 
reports historically. I was looking at a few of them. Um, I think it was last year. Um, the reports that they put out now, um, mm. my question is technical in that at the end of the year, they have these pending cases still in that category of pending. And my question was, what happens to those pending cases? How are they reported the following year? Because I didn't see any indication that those pending cases were then rolled over to the next year and then um, the resolution was given in that report, that summary data. So that was the very technical question um, <laughs> that appeared. Um, I believe I asked someone last year, I don't remember if it was the post board, I think it was, and I don't remember that I ever got an answer, but it just seemed like, seemed like some of those cases were just out there dangling and we didn't really know how they were um, resolved. So that's, that's it, Madam Chair, thank you for the um, yep. ability to give the question. Yeah, uh, Representative Fraser, any response? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, that was a really good qu technical question that I don't have the answer to, but I'll, I'll ask that question too, I mean, because that, that is information that we should be aware of. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Representative Fraser. And, and if we could get that answer and then we can share it with the rest of the committee as well, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker, Finn, Representative Frazier. I uh, just uh, but you know, I'm a no, no on this bill. We tried to uh, adjust it a little bit in the previous committee, and uh, you refu refuse the, that amendment. But the data data is important. The private data is also private. Uh, there's no safeguards on this data. There's also only if, if just partial partial data is being sent. A very important part of uh, officer complaints is who's reporting, who's making the complaints. I think back to uh, when I was on the road, we had a person by the name of Jim. We had where when we had a policy for every officer, including the state patrol, every time we dealt with them, a, a re either audio or video recording had to be on. Because every time he had contact and he'd walk up you up to you and start talking to you. And when he got done the next day, he'd file a complaint. It was continuously uh, 50 to 60 complaints a year on different officers. So having the complainant data is just as important as having the officer data. It shows when somebody has a grudge against an officer, filing uh, fictitious complaints, it can be, uh, dev and if you're not getting that information, you're getting false data, getting false information. And with bad data, you make bad decisions. You need the entire amount of data. Uh, earlier in, in, the, uh, in the other hearing, it talked about um, anonymous complaints. If you actually read the statutes, unless the person signs the complaint, it does not exist because it's against the law to make a false report on an officer. Also with some of this private data, if it gets out, um, in, I don't know if uh, these members know this or not, but if it's a complaint on an undercover officer, a local city or sheriff's office cannot even admit that that in person is an employee of that department. Uh, it's for the safety of the officer. And the other concern I have with this private data, the private data getting into uh, being sent out is should the uh, committee on that wants this data, not post board, the other committee, release that data whether intentionally or not, that data could be used and, and could possibly be a, a safety issue for that officer if it gives, puts out their home address and stuff like that. So we got to look at it very carefully. I don't think this bill is written tightly enough and to get the proper data. So that's why I cannot afford it, uh, support it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Johnson. I, I will note for the record that there were no amendments filed uh, for this bill today and um, just wanted to also correct the record that there, there were amendments brought forward and discussed in the Public Safety Committee, but 
uh, were were voted down in that committee. Uh, you know, no no single person uh, can stop uh, an amendment uh, from from occurring. So, I uh, just wanted to make sure that was clear. Uh, any uh, any further discussion to the bill, members? Madam Chair, if I may respond to Representative Johnson's lengthy commentary. Yes. Yes, uh, Representative Frazier, and then uh, why don't you go ahead with your, your closing comments and we'll move to the vote. Thank you. Representative Johnson, I, I, I think we, we do have a disagreement on what this bill will do. And, I, and we did discuss this in the Public Safety Committee that the data remains private. Um, and that complaint data, and thank you for bringing the, the, the knowledge about what the statutes currently say about any they're not being able to be allowed for anonymous complaints. That complaint data, along with those names, would be submitted to post. They would be able to thoroughly with their uh, uh, discretion, go through that information and decide which data is appropriate data for them to use to take action on. And that's that's what this is about. And I'll, I'll go into my closing here. Um, you know, this is about building more trust with communities, building more trust so that, you know, folks that want to serve, that want to commit, that want to have public service as police officers can, can stay in a profession and come into the profession knowing that we are working to build a better public safety system where there will be trust between the public safety officers and the communities that they serve. That's what this is about. It is about an early warning system that will be a preventative measure so that we don't have more Jamar Clark, so that we don't have more George Floyds. We know that the officer that kneeled on George Floyd, he had several other complaints where he used that same tactic and those where it was private data because he was only coached and they did not have access to that data. And if it's possible that it could have been prevented if we had a system like this in place and if they had access to that data. So no, this is not about pushing people out. This is about making a system that will allow more folks to come in and stay in this profession because they can truly do what they wanna do and that is serve the public, everyone in the community, and keep them safe. With that, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Frazier. Uh, Representative Frazier renews his motion that House File 1374 be recommended to be re-referred to Ways and Means. The clerk will take the roll. Thank you. Chair Beckerton. Aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Representative Scott. No. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Her. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. No. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen? No. Representative Navani? No. Representative Farr? No. Representative Robbins? No. Representative Vang? Aye. Representative Zhang? Aye. There are 10 ayes and six nays. All right, with that, the motion prevails and House File 1374 is recommended to be re-referred to Ways and Means. Uh, members, we have we have eight more minutes. Uh, we're at least going to uh, start with some testimony on the next bill. Uh, the next bill on the agenda is House File 972. Uh, Representative Herr, would you like to move your bill be recommended to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Judiciary Finance Omnibus Bill? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, yes, so moved. And I do have one amendment and author's amendment to the bill as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Representative Herr. Uh, now that you have moved that House File 972 uh, be recommended to laid be laid over, would you like to move the A1 amendment? Uh, I would like to move the A1 amendment, uh, Madam Chair. And the, the amendment is actually pretty easy. It's just uh, an update to the pay rate for interpreters and leaves open the appropriation amount for my and mileage reimbursement as we're waiting for the data from the court system. Very good. Uh, any discussion to the A1 amendment? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Herr, your bill as amended is now before us. Uh, please uh, tell us about your bill or we can go to testifiers, whichever you would prefer. Um, Madam Chair, we'll just go quickly through this because this is a non-controversial bill. Uh, this is just a bill appropriating, uh, asking for appropriation of funds to increase pay and update mileage reimbursement for court interpreters. The uh, judicial interpreters uh, bridge the linguistic gap in Minnesota's criminal and civil courts, state-funded domestic abuse service centers, state penitentiaries and holding cells, state and municipal government offices, and more. Without interpreters, both our judicial partners and limited English proficient immigrants and citizens cannot communicate. 
They provide professional, competent, and indispensable services so the executive and judicial branch of government functions as smoothly as possible. In 1997, spoken language interpreters pay was set at $50 for certified interpreters and $40 for non-certified interpreters in the, on, the, uh, on the court roster. After waiting 20 years, interpreters received a compensation adjustment. In July of 2017, they received a 4% or a $2 increase. As a point of comparison, American language sign, uh, American sign language interpreters uh, were started at similar pay and their rate increased 64% during the same time period to $86 an hour. One might argue that this rate difference is due to supply and demand, but that is not the case. There is such a shortage of, a shortage of certified language interpreters that oftentimes it is difficult to get the necessary service to those in need. Since we started tracking last year, 50 people who were listed on the roster are no longer interpreting in the courts. That means our roster, the same one used for the courts, which started with 256 people, is down to 204 people. People have constantly cited that the low pay from the courts is a factor for why they are choosing to do uh, other interpreting work. After paying taxes, fees, and expenses associated with the job, the effective hourly pay for an assignment uh, 15 miles away or three hours interpreter's time is, 13, is $18.51. And for those that are 30 miles away, which is four hours, it's $10.94. Spoken language interpreters work full-time in the courts and they struggle to make a living. Uh, we do, um, I have a lot more I wanted to say, but I do want, in the interest of time, we do have uh, one test. We have many testifiers, but we're gonna limit it to just one. And we do have a testifier here today, uh, Ms. Kajwa uh, Yang. She is a Hmong interpreter and um, she is ready to testify, Madam Chair. All right, uh, thank you, Representative Her. And, and to be clear, we can um, we can bring this up uh, in the, the next committee when we meet on uh, Thursday, if so folks can fully discuss. I'm not gonna rush us through that, but um, since we do have uh, Ms. Yang here to testify, uh, if Ms. Yang, if you wanna int introduce yourself and please uh, go ahead with your testimony. Uh, good morning. My name is Kajua Yang. Thank you for having us this morning. My testify is that testimony is that I am one of six certified Hmong interpreters in the whole country. And I worked for the state of Minnesota. I ran the second judicial interpreter's office for 20 years. I was also part of the interpreter advisory task group that set the payment policy for language interpreters and ASL interpreters. 20 years ago, I am a single mom and I am now a freelance Hmong, Hmong interpreter. Um, $52 is not enough to sustain a normal life lifestyle. Keep in mind that we do not have health insurance. We don't have vacation. We don't have sick pay. And a lot of times when I'm at the doctor's office, I have a very high deductible that I have to pay out, out of pocket. Um, with this money, it will help uh, get with with the money it will help to raise that we're raising here will help the interpreters um, with the cost of living. It will also motivate me and other interpreters to take more assignments and more and more court cases. Also makes us feel like our skills are appreciated. The ASL interpreters got a fifty six percent raise, opposed to the spoken interpreters who have a four four percent raise. Um, you may think that well fifty two dollars is a lot of money, but Parking in downtown Minneapolis and downtown um, Ramsey is not cheap. It's about $20. There's mileage. I, I live in, in, in White Bear Township. For me to drive to South Dell is 29 miles each way. I don't get mileage unless it's 30 miles or more. So with traffic and all, it takes me 45 minutes to get to court um, and in back. And think about the self-employment, high self-employment taxes that, that we have to pay. There's a lot of, there's like 80,000 Hmong people in Minnesota. There's six of us that are certified in the whole country. I fly all over the country to interpret. If we can get the help here, we can train more interpreters, offer more, more certification exams, and we can have equal justice for a lot of the spoken language interpreters that need certified interpreters um, in the court system. So I thank you for your time and for listening to me today. And I hope that you will take this into, into consideration for all the spoken interpreters. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I, I know as, as someone who has worked in a courtroom, um, you know, the courtroom very much relies on, on interpreters and it's a high level of interpreting and, you know, there really is no other time when we, it's, it's important that we get 
get things right and that we are able to communicate well. Um, and uh, often access to the interpreter is, is something that can keep us from being as efficient as we would like to be um, because there just aren't enough interpreters uh, to get scheduled. Um, with that members, uh, I'm gonna lay this over, but we will save a couple minutes uh, in one of our, our meetings on Thursday uh, to further discuss this. And, and if there are any of your other testifiers, Representative Her, who would like to testify at that time, I don't, um, not, not gonna rush it through uh, right now now, um, you know, given that we have one minute left, but uh, so that that is the plan, members. Uh, we'll we'll bring this up at one of the Thursday uh, meetings or possibly Friday, and um, to make sure that we've uh, gotten any of our questions answered. Uh, Representative Johnson, I do see your hand is up, but we'll just wait and get to that um, until we uh, we bring this up the next time. Uh, so with that, members, uh, we uh, it is ten o'clock and we are adjourned. Thank you. Oh, I guess the, sorry, uh, the bill is I will lay over uh, House File 972 and with the intention that we'll bring it back up uh, to discuss at a later date. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.